Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Train Systems, joined as always by Max Montana. Mr. Max Ada, head coach at Juggernaut HQ. Today we're going to continue our series uh, of critiques, program critiques, with the context being the scientific principles of strength training by myself, Dr. Mike Isretel, and Dr. James Hoffman. And today we're going to be talking about a program very near, maybe not so dear, <laughs> to Max. And uh, that's the Bulgarian method, Bulgarian system, Bulgarian strategy, squat every day, a lot of different names. And because of that, it being kind of a vague thing, we want to define what it is that we're actually critiquing beforehand. So what we really want to critique today is the Bulgarian system in its truest form. And that's going to be for both powerlifting and weightlifting. And so Max, kind of... Especially as it pertains to the squat, we're going to define it as uh, near maximum or maximum attempts um, with a high frequency every day or multiple times per day with very little exercise variation. So essentially back squat or front squat or just one of those done you know, in a very narrow intensity band over 90%, 9,500%, even 105% weights with no real phasic structure. So no planned rests, no planned deloads, no plan to change the repetitions or sets or volume throughout the cycle. So squatting to one or multiple maxes every day, all day, all the time. And Max, how long did you train in this fashion for? Uh, with the squat, at least at least 13 years, maybe more than that even. Yeah. How many max squats have, do you think you've actually squatted in your life? Uh, you know, there was a point where I tried to count up how many times I had done at least 600, and I, there was a maybe six month period where I squatted 600 every single workout, at least three workouts a day for six months. So whatever that is, three times seven is 21 20, times, 80. yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's over 2,000, that's almost 3,000 times yeah. right there. Yeah, that was a lot. Jesus. Sounds miserable. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So th this system or method idea has really seemed to gain a lot of popularity uh, in the last several years, maybe really last year, year and a half. And, yeah, YouTube and, and Instagram and stuff makes it very popular, and it's a very easily digestible system, very easy to understand, uh, that there's really not much to it besides squat to a max every single day. And we want to talk about the benefits uh, potential benefits of this and the potential pitfalls of it in for powerlifters and weightlifters. So first off, the guiding principle, you know, the thing that creates a framework for all other programming considerations is specificity. And specificity is one spot that Squat Every Day or Bulgarian training does a great job of. Because both the sports powerlifting and weightlifting are about one rep maxes, doing one rep maxes all the time is highly, highly specific. Certainly less specific for weightlifting as you're doing maxes in an exercise that's not actually a competition exercise. But for powerlifting, uh, for both of them, it, is, it ranks high in specificity because of your exercise selection and because of the way that you're loading that exercise really very, very similar to the, to the competition or exactly the same as the competition. Now some negatives in regards to specificity for squat every day. For powerlifting, I'd say the biggest negative is that you're putting a disproportionate amount of energy towards just one lift. And it's a sport, a simple sport, but yet a sport of three lifts. And if you're squatting every single day to maximum, multiple times a day to maximum, it's really going to start to take away from the energy you have to put towards the bench press and deadlift. And while the squat is great and an important part of powerlifting, it's really about the highest total you can make. So you have to consider, does putting so much energy towards the squat help me make a higher total, or does it really just help me make a higher squat? Right. That's the biggest, that's the biggest failure in terms of powerlifting, is that you end up completely one-sided in your training, right? The, the fatigue generated and the energy that goes into one lift is not, is not proportional to what you're going to get out of it. So when you, when you switched from weightlifting to powerlifting, 
you had this massive discrepancy in your squat and deadlift, correct? I had a very big, yeah. I could front squat 500 pounds way before I could even break it off the ground in a deadlift. I couldn't even deadlift 500 pounds till after I squatted maybe 660. So while well, you might be watching this thinking, well, if my squat goes up, my deadlift's going to go up too. Yeah. Again, At least in this one example, the correlation could be really low. Yes, yeah. The, the correlation is not is not as direct as it can be in some cases for with different people, but you're going to get better at what you practice. And just assuming that you'll improve one lift because you're doing something very similar or what appears to be similar because the musculature that you use is the same, the, the structure and the technique of the exercise is so different that you may not get anything out of it. What about for weightlifting in regards to specificity? Uh, in regards to specificity for weightlifting, if as a component of the entire system, squatting every day fits into the system, the Bulgarian strategy very well, because that's what the entire system is built around. But as an accompaniment to other programs or to programs where if you have issues that are different than just having a weak leg, weak legs, the system is going to eat up so much of your abilities, your body's ability to adapt and, and train that you're going to end up in the same place as powerlifting, where all your energy is going towards squatting when you don't need that much more leg strength, right? Uh, and it's certainly, as an accessory movement to your Olympic lifting total, not the most important factor, right? Do you, you get into the ratios of the lifts at all? Uh, the ratio, looking at ratios of lifts is good in a way to see where people are uh, in need of training, right? Where does the volume need to go? How, what's the proportion of, you know, do they squat, you know, 300 kilograms and clean and jerk 180? Because that's not a good ratio. It's clearly they have plenty of, of limit strength. They don't have enough speed strength or uh, explosive strength. So those qualities needs to be emphasized. So it's, the ratios are good in a sense that gives you an idea of what is most important to focus on. It's not simply, sometimes I think there's a, a downfall where people believe Olympic weightlifting training is somehow dependent on the squat. Even though we do a lot of squatting and weightlifting and squatting is a huge component of it, just having the biggest squat does not equal being the best weightlifter. And no, that, I, that haven't, I have not been very good at weightlifting yeah. in my <laughs> Exactly, right? You see a lot of lifters that are, they squat every day, they squat very hard, they have very good squats, but they're very slow lifters. And that's uh, it's not an advantage to be slow in weightlifting. So it can be a, a big detriment. As far as being, being specific, it is in that, yes, the heavy attempts are very similar and maximum efforts, but in terms of becoming better at the sport, it's limited in its application. So moving on to overload, the second most important principle Bulgarian system is going to score well in a lot of the same ways it does for specificity. It's very heavy. It's going to be sufficiently intense to drive general strength gains and certainly the neural qualities that you need for one rep max lifting. And the technical proficiency, which is also very important, if you're practicing one rep maxes all the time, your technique for one rep maxes should be getting a lot better. The negative parts of the overload is that for, for one, your the amount of fatigue generated from it is tremendous, and because of that, you're not able to incorporate other forms of training, other forms of rep ranges, or other kind of other motor qualities can be trained well during that time where you're so fatigued. From from a standpoint of being able to rest enough to to recover from these sessions, you're limited because. If you don't train in that system, you know, with heavy maximum attempts on a regular basis, you're not going to get the benefits of it. So you can't have like a halfway in between, right? And the overload just becomes the only thing that's important. And then you're, you're kind of stuck chasing your own tail all the time. Yeah. So we're, we're going to get more in depth in, in some of those points that Max talks about. But the, kind of the key for overload, the negative aspect of Bulgarian system for overload, is that it's going to lack sufficient volume to drive any kind of hypertrophy, any, any type of hypertrophic gains. So it's doing a great job for strength and the neural qualities and technical proficiency, possibly, but as far as having sufficient volume, it's gonna fall down in that area in regards to overload. So the third most important principle, fatigue management. And these next several principles, it's not looking very good for the Bulgarian system. In a system 
that is designed on squatting multiple maxes, you know, one, let's call it one plus maxes every single day. Sunday's off? Yeah, sometimes, mostly Sundays off. Mostly, but so six to seven days a week, max squatting, maybe multiple times a day maxes, maybe what was your peak, 40 maxes in a week? Yeah. It does a very, very, very bad job of fatigue management. The one positive that we could say for it is squatting a one rep max every single day is doing a better job of fatigue management than squatting a three rep max every day or a five rep max every day. The bad qualities in, <laughs> in fatigue management are obviously that you're, the more fatigue you generate, the harder time you're going to have keeping technique solidified and at the same time developing your skills and, and keeping your speed qualities consistent. So as fatigue fluctuates essentially up and down in an unpredictable way, because you're training with the exact same program over and over again, there's no point at which there's any kind of reprieve from the loading. So your body is in a place where you're always kind of just reacting to what's that, what the daily load is. Because you get in a place like that, you have inconsistent technique, your speed qualities are inconsistent, and developing the most important parts of weightlifting, which are speed, technique, you're going to end up in a, with haphazard technique or, or stuck in a place where you're too slow because you're not ever allowing a chance to recover from that. Lack of, of energy devo- that you can devote to the other things is also a big issue in terms of if you're always tired from squatting, you're not going to snatch or clean jerk very well. Yeah, or bench or deadlift very well right. in regards to powerlifting. So moving on to SRA, uh, stimulus recovery adaptation, and any of these topics we've gone over so far, I have videos that are much more in depth just about these specific principles. So make sure you go check out our SRA fatigue management, principle of overload, and uh, specificity videos to learn more about what those are, how you can properly apply them, and how you may be improperly applying them. For SRA, which is really this, the process of training, introducing a stimulus, fatigue being created from that, and then as you recover and adapt, you know, some super compensation happening to where you adapt and improve your strength qualities, speed qualities, whatever it is you're training for, to above the previous level that they were at. And this is really a time dependent, you know, also certainly genetics, recovery modalities, supplementation, dependent on all those all those qualities. The Bulgarian system and SRA, very much like fatigue management, there really is no SRA. There's no time in between heavy training sessions for you to recover and adapt. And I think a lot of what Max is talking about, this like unpredictability of your readiness, you know, that one day you squat a PR, one day you're 15 kilos below that, you know, just miss a new PR, or it's just kind of all over the place where you can't really see any sort of pattern of, all right, I'm, I'm feeling worse, 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 and now I take some time off and then I feel better, better, better. That doesn't really exist, and that's because of a lack of SRA existing in the structure of the program. The particularly bad things in regards to SRA are that there's not sufficient recovery time for recovery and adaptation, and it's going to be extremely taxing to the neural system because all of the lifts are limit lifts. They're you know, 90% plus, 95% plus, 98% plus lifts, particularly when you're doing them under the uh, <laughs> caring, watchful eye of Ivan Abjev. Yeah, like the kind eyes of Abjev, yeah. or even Goff. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be so stressful neurally, and the neural SRA curve is already longer than the muscular SRA curve. So if, if you were training you know, a bit more volume multiple times per week, but at much lower intensities, it could be feasible that you're able to recover and adapt from that. But max, 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 day after day, or morning after afternoon after morning afternoon, uh, it's just not going to allow for any any neural recovery between those. The biggest the biggest issue too with the SRA is that there's no predictability because the structure is essentially uh, monotone. There's only one. There's only real one very narrow band of intensity and narrow band of, of, of uh, a pinpoint focus in the program. There's no structure that can be predicted where we know that we start 70 days or whatever before competition, that in 70 days we're going to be stronger on this particular day. 
And that's where I feel like, especially for powerlifting, it falls very short in that you're not setting yourself up well to have the, the best possible results at the best time because you can't predict exactly when you're going to recover from, from those loads or to what degree you're going to recover, right? To what degree supercompensation is going to take place. So moving on to the next uh, principle, variation. Again, we're talking about the, the Bulgarian system or Bulgarian strategy in its purest form. The way that Max trained under Steve Goff and under Ivan Abjev, the Bulgarian national team weightlifting coach. And in that, its purest form, Bulgarian system and squat every day has no variation. It is, I mean, if, if we're going to give front squat and back squat as variations, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even that wasn't the case for yeah, you for a long time. Neither, neither coach really had more than just front squat. I mean, back squat was occasional. If you hurt your hand or something or your elbow hurt, you'd just back squat. But almost entirely front squat. Yeah, but very, very high percentage front squat. So essentially no variation. Because of the lack of variation, it's going to lend itself big time to staleness, where I mean, either mental or physical, where you're just doing the same exercise for the same loading strategy, session after session after session, days, weeks, months, years on end, and uh, it's going to get boring. <laughs> and besides that, from a physiological standpoint, the longer you, you train for one quality without any without any variation to it, the slower those gains are going to come. So if all you're doing is max front squatting every single day, you know, eking out a one kilo PR every week or two, Yeah. what point did it really get to? Like how long was it b between making PRs as you got farther into it? Uh, I remember in the first, the first six weeks I increased my front squat from, I was about eight, 17, 18, I went from like 165 kilos to 217 in six weeks. And from 217 to 230 took almost eight more months. And then I don't remember between that 230 and 245, 250, and probably another nine months a year. And it was mostly, you know, the progress was not predictable or consistent yeah. or repeatable in any sense to say I know that in six more months I'm getting another 10 kilo pro, you know, PR that was, that was very sporadic and those numbers are probably more skewed actually they're probably even longer more like two or three years from 230 to 240. The nature of the system doesn't really lend itself to variation because if you were to use new you know, different squatting variations every day maybe you had six different squat variations and you worked up to a max in one every single day, then you're introducing novel stimulus, which is actually gonna induce more fatigue than doing the same exercise over and over. And as we already said, there's really not any fatigue management that exists in this system. So it could almost be compounding the problem in that principle while making a slight improvement in this in variation, a less important priority than fatigue management. The next principle is phase potentiation. As Max mentioned earlier, it doesn't exist. Right? The Bulgarian system totally lacks phase potentiation. It is doing the exact same thing all the time. So again, phase potentiation is the idea of using one phase of training to increase the potential of subsequent phases of training. So the way that I usually do that with the programs that I write is using hypertrophy to build a bigger muscle, then general strength to teach that bigger muscle how to produce more force, then taking that into peaking and honing the technical and neural qualities of that bigger, more force producing muscle. And then now you've increased your strength and now you go back to hypertrophy and you can now use heavier weights than you were using prior. But when it's just one rep max, one rep max, one rep max, you've totally thrown the idea of phase potentiation out. Similar to our West Side critique, the Bulgarian system was really big on always being ready to compete. And you're saying the guys were competing sometimes like 16 times a year is what I was told. I know at least, at least on a very regular basis, probably once a month, if not more. As great as it is to be a good competitor and, and improve your competition abilities, like handling the pressure of competition and the timing of it and all that stuff, it's not necessary to be ready to compete all the time because there are not competitions all the time 
or they're not important competitions, at least, all the time. So taking some time to build up your abilities rather than constantly testing them, testing them, testing them is going to be a lot better for people in the long run because as you look at your competition calendar or creating an annual plan, there are competitions that are more and less important to you. So essentially doing a competition in the gym every single day isn't going to help you improve your abilities the most. So that brings us to individual differences. This is the final principle, the least important. Oftentimes I think people give it maybe too much credence, but this is another one where the Bulgarian system and squat every day really doesn't take, in, doesn't take this principle into account at all. You know, if, were people, any, anyone doing other exercises? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing that's Nothing that's planned in the long, the yearly training cycle that that's this is going to do that or this. You know, it's essentially the same exercises. I'm sure there, I'm sure there is some of that, but it's it's not on a global scale. It's accepted as a principle. It's just sort of someone's going to do this because they feel they need it, right? Uh, I don't think you could, I don't think you could include that in the system as being part of it because it's not something that's that's really a major component. So like individual differences, like when you hurt your hand, you get to back squat. Yes, exactly. Instead yeah. of front squat. When you're yeah, when you're hurting, you do this exercise because it's only can all you can do. Yeah. And of course, this is going to be a problem because without any variation to be made from person to person with exercise selection, you know, rep ranges, volume, rest, you know, training frequency, then it really just becomes an issue of how well is this person genetically predisposed to success within this very, very narrow system. You know, often the Bulgarian system is criticized as, as they call it, the object of the butcher, and is criticized as taking a big pool of athletes and just kind of whittling them down by natural selection, more or less, of who could handle the training. But that uh, is kind of a misconception. Yeah, there. I don't think that's actually entirely, I don't think that's entirely true because the volume of lifters he would have isn't very big. The country of Bulgaria is only maybe 6 million people, maybe 8 million people. So you're not drawing from a pool of 150,000 people. But at one point in time, we did the math to figure out how many lifters there, there potentially were, um, and it was a very low number, less than USAW numbers by far. You know, and that included kids, you know, teenagers, and senior lifters. So it's not entirely that kind of system. Uh, Something to consider with that, too, and I think uh, a little bit off topic, but when you're looking at how many lifters a country has. The USA, Canada probably to a lesser degree, uh, UK to a lesser degree, Australia maybe, but the really big weightlifting countries, China, Russia, Kazakhstan, North Korea, there is no such thing as recreational weightlifting right. or recreational sport in general. So while USAW has 20,000 members right now, I wonder, you know, I'm not sure the number of those that are really, really serious, like full-time training, trying to go to the Olympics lifters. When Max has a thousand lifters in Bulgaria, you know, depending on where they are uh, age-wise, but all 1,000 of those goal was right. eventually to go to the Olympics. Obviously, there's a lot of problems with the Bulgarian system. A lot of things in regards to, you know, commonly accepted sports science that they are just not doing. They're totally overlooking them. Yet, people were still really, really successful. The highest snatch of all time yeah. is done by a Bulgarian lifter. They produced Olympic champions. There are people currently training on squat every day programs in powerlifting and weightlifting who are very successful. I know I talked to a lifter named Justin Caputo. He's squatted 6'10 at 165 in sleeves, which is the world record, or was the world record at the time, I'm not sure if it still was, and he was squatting 12 times a week. Front squat to a max in the morning, back squat to a max in the afternoon. So there are people being extremely successful in this program, even though it defies so many of the principles that, in my opinion, really guide good programming. So how is that possible? Well, for one, the major components are that specificity and overload are so extremely high in terms of those two factors are pushed the absolute most. And they're the biggest components of, of the scientific principles, right? Those yeah. are the 
underlying foundation of it. So something that's really important to consider is that specificity and overload make up over 50% of what goes into creating a successful program. So even though the Bulgarian system was really scoring zeros in what, five or four of the no, five of the seven scientific principles, the two top most important principles they're doing a great job on. It's highly, highly, highly specific training with tremendous overload. And if you have a program that's doing those two things well, even if you're not doing a lot of the other things well, you could still be successful. But of course, in making videos like this and the content we produce at Juggernaut, we want to help you guys create the most optimal training possible. And that's why, even though they're doing a great job with, with those two, it's still not optimal training. But what are some other things that you think makes them successful? The other factors relating to the Bulgarian specifically is drug use. So if you factor in periods of time where performance enhancing drugs are utilized in the system, you end up with a couple of unique situations. One is an intensification of the loading because the drugs make you stronger and they increase your ability to recover. So you end up with, for one, a, a different phase, a different period of training that's, that goes from intense and heavy to more intense and heavier. So you could look at that as, as a phase potentiation in some degree. And definitely going to help with fatigue management And as fatigue well. management and even more overload. Then the other factor is for weightlifting, the lifts themselves, the speed components will get better as you recover more. Uh, so technical mastery can be maintained for longer. Those kind of components are going to, all of the things we talked about, the negative, are going to change to some degree with the, uh, the incorporation of some performance enhancing drugs. You said a lot, of, uh, a lot of times it was kind of the way that the guys were training was... Yeah, they'd, they'd start the training cycle or period or whatever and get a little bit stronger and then just feel worse, worse, yeah. worse, worse, worse. And then the drugs are introduced yep. and it's kind of this, you know, yeah. turbo boost. Well, it's, yeah, was it explained to me was that they would get to camp, they'd be training hard for, uh, you know, before the actual camp started. There's this 40-day window where they would be taking whatever performance testing drugs and then... During that, during that window, the training was intensified and, and no slacking off was allowed. A, a, a doubling of the efforts was essentially incorporated where, where maximum was an all-out thing. Missed lifts were, were very common, just an absolute push for intensity and overload. Clearly made possible by the, the use of the drugs um, in addition to the benefits the drugs gave them in terms of the increase in strength. And some of that Max mentioned in there, slacking off, uh, if you've watched our uh, previous interview we, we did with Max called Max Ada, A Squatting Life, um, talks more about this, but this will go back to the idea of fatigue <laughs> management. A important concept in actual training in Bulgaria is krushka. Yeah. Tell us more about krushka. Krushka is the word that didn't, it didn't have a direct translation to English that, I, that we knew of. And it was a word that essentially means that you're going to, that if, if you're being Krushka or you are Krushka, you're the guy who's, when he's supposed to squat 250 kilos today, you maybe squat 230 when the coach isn't looking or 200 when the coach isn't looking and you tell him that you did. That's Krushka. 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 To maximum. To maximum. <laughs> yes. So I guess they did do a better job of fatigue management that maybe we said, <laughs> if they were properly <laughs> implementing Krushka into the training. The majority of people have been successful in that system and that Bulgarian weightlifters during the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, you know, training under Abjayev were primarily successful was that they were doing a great job with specificity and overload, that they were taking drugs, and finally, that they were just kind of insanely tough yes. people. Very, very tough. Very, like, just every single person on the Bulgarian team was somewhat off, I'm sure. I, from just meeting a few of them, like, people just, just thugs. I mean, so many just, like, different types of people from different walks of life that were not, you know, they, they would, a lot of the recruiting that they did was in, like, more small villages and stuff, but also, like, finding kids that were, you know, kind of rough and... At-risk youth. Yeah, at-risk, that's the politically correct term, I guess, <laughs> at-risk youth. You know, and those guys pan out because they fight, they're fighters, and you have to be a fighter to survive in the system. You can't just 
you can't be scared of things. You can't be kind of, uh, you know, soft and expect to get through on, you know, your charm. You, you have to fight with the bar every single day. And if you wanted to be, you know, if you are one of these Bulgarian at-risk youths and wanted to be successful in life, being a great weightlifter was a yep. way for them to, you know, that's like trying to go to the NFL. If you grew up in Bulgaria, trying to go to the NBA. If you were going to become a great Olympic weightlifter, that was going to help you, you know, provide for yourself and your family. So the motivation that was part of it was just a lot different than probably anyone here in the U.S. trying to train in the Bulgarian system at this point. Right. It's very different. The other thing that I, I want to mention, too, is like there's a lot of putting the word Bulgarian system or doing the Bulgarian training in front of something that is a modification of it. When you modify it, you diminish what it was originally. And if you modify it to, sm to a small degree, why not just modify it to a bigger degree? And if you're going to modify it to a big degree, why not just do something that makes more sense from a, a you know, different from a perspective of the scientific principles, right? Small modifications will eventually turn into big ones, so why not start with the big ones and just start with something different? Yeah, so now what we want to talk about is how can you manipulate this system for your own success? And certainly the first step of that is just going to be to not do it at all and to do things that fulfill all of the principles, you know, that do a great job with specificity, overload that's sufficient for strength, peaking, and hypertrophy, some sort of fatigue management structure with planned light days or deloads, SRA that's sufficient between overloading sessions to allow for recovery and adaptation, variation in the lifts enough to avoid staleness, enough to bring up lagging portions of the lift or, or muscle groups, phasic structure to the training that's going to help you build qualities that are going to benefit you in the future, and a training program that accounts for differences, intra and inter individual differences. So times where you might have more stress in your life and your MRV is a little bit down compared to times where you have outside training stress in your life. So that would be our first suggestion is to just not do this type of training because there are so, so many flaws in it. But if you are so dead set on wanting to do a squat every day type of program, a Bulgarian training program like Max Montana did for 13 years of his life, there are a couple adjustments that you can make within the spirit of the system to probably help you be more successful. The first one of those is going to be to use it periodically, mm -hmm. that it's not all of your training. It's not every day of every week, of every month, of every year of your training. It is going to be periodically used as a peaking block. What In terms of peaking, the system can be used, let's say you're by uh, a modern athlete in living in the United States, right? So someone who's not in the situation the Bulgarians were. You could almost look at it as an extended peaking block where it, it would almost be called like technically like a plateau block where your results stay slightly sub-maximum. So they're, they're not peak, they're not as high as they could possibly be, but they're as high as you can keep them for an extended period of time. If you have competitions that you need to compete in, in you know, over the course of six weeks or eight weeks, you need to compete in three or four competitions. It would work exceptionally well at keeping you in that level of fitness for that long a time. Extending it longer than that will just slow down the, the results you can make. Reducing its use to be after different phases of, of more general training so you can take advantage of those things more. If you have more hypertrophy training, more general strength training for several blocks and then finish maybe the second half of the year with a, a longer, you know, four to eight week long or 12 week long block of Bulgarian sort of modified training, you can maintain a lot of the results you've made initially in the block, the, the first half of the year. And that's important to, to remember too, is we're talking about long-term training right. process. Because you might be watching this thinking, well, you know, my squat went up this much while doing this training, or, you know, I heard my buddy said that his squat went from 400 to 450 in eight weeks or six weeks or whatever it is. That's great. Max said the exact same thing. His front squat went up 50 kilos, 52 kilos in six weeks. And then it took another over six months to go up 13 kilos. And then years at a time after that for five 
10 kilo increases, multiple years to increase the squat five kilos. That's not a successful long-term training strategy. So even though it may have been successful for you or your friend, in the short term, that's great. And that's how it should be applied, is in the short term. Other adjustments that you could make with still kind of staying within the spirit of things, but improving it for yourself would be to add some degree of variation to the system. Whether that's using multiple squatting variations, like just front squat and back squat. Low bar squat doesn't really lend itself well to everyday squatting just because the back is involved so much more and that's going to fatigue more quickly than the legs will. Small variations in stance widths, is, that's just going to help you avoid staleness. Manipulating the volume, like doing two rep maxes or three rep maxes, five reps, occasionally just squatting that day, not to a max. Maybe squatting multiple doubles or triples or, or a couple sets of five. Those small changes will still allow you to squat every day if you are dead set on that idea but should make the program a little bit more successful for you in the longer term. But again, it's not best designed for a long-term training strategy. I can actually even even anecdotally corroborate the information, that, that strategy, because as I got older and as I started training different after I became injured, I did do exactly those things, incorporate more volume, more sets that included higher repetitions, you know, two and three reps, which is still a huge Double variation. and triple. Doubles and triples. <laughs> and uh, double and, and triple the previous volume. Yeah, occasionally sets of five and, and, you know, those kind of things. And I, and I saw, again, faster results. Right away started seeing bigger results. But again, it was not as, uh, it's not as efficient as it can be. For anybody, it's not as efficient as it can be, right? So as you're watching this, I please, encourage you to heed Max's advice in this. Probably more so than anyone else you will ever talk to or hear speak. He has trained this way longer under the person who actually invented the system. And he is still not telling you that it is the best way to develop a squat. And he's a great squatter. So what was your best squat? 738 at 220 in powerlifting. And what, what was your best squat doing Bulgarian 683, training? 683, 680, whatever, 310. 672? 672. 672, 738. 738 with, with the powerlifting, like... Style. A phasic structure. Yeah. Did Bulgarian-style training get Max to squat to be really, really high? Yes, definitely. But when he's talking about taking three years, five years, to improve five or ten kilos, that's probably not something that you're that interested in doing. I mean, three year that's that could be probably on the low end, 2,700 max squats. Yeah. Oh yeah. If three three times a day max squatting for three years. Yeah. If you want to squat twenty seven hundred max singles to improve ten kilos, go for it. This video is probably not gonna, <laughs> not gonna change your mind. But if you're interested in a more concise, more sustainable type of training, please take our advice into account. Check out our book, Scientific Principles of Strength Training. Check out our podcast, the Jug Life Podcast. Uh, find that on iTunes or on jtsstrength.com and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.